in a while. Now, as you get one, you can go ahead and put your name on it in the upper right-hand corner if you choose, if you have a pen. Uh, I'm a former teacher, so old teachers never die. They just find someplace else to lecture. And um, I'm excited to share with you today how to dramatically improve your results with marketing no matter what you do. And if you have any questions, you can also put them down here and uh, we can hand handle them in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. First, what we're going to cover is how most people unknowingly shoot themselves in the foot with their marketing. And then next, we're briefly going to touch on what you can do to improve your own marketing message. And then next, uh, you're going to discover the best people for you to be marketing to. And then lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to spend time on how to best reach those people you want to market to. And if time's permitting, if you've got any extra time, I have some bonus material, I think you're going to find fascinating and helpful. Now my goal today, at the very least, is I hope you find our talk thought-provoking and it encourages you to see your business or your vocation from a unique and different perspective than you did before you came. Um, well, I'm thinking on my opening remarks for our talk today, I couldn't stop thinking about a gentleman from Ireland uh, named Muldoon. Now Muldoon lived in the Irish countryside with only a pet dog for company. One day his dog died and Muldoon went to the the parish priest, and he said, Father, me dog is dead. Could you be saying a mass for the poor creature? Father Patrick replied, Ooh, I'm afraid not. We cannot be having services for an animal in the church. But there's some Baptists down the lane. There's no telling what they believe. Maybe they could do something for the creature. <laughs> Muldoon thought about it for a minute, and mused, and he says, I'll go right, right, right away, Father. Do you think $5,000 is enough to donate for the service? Father Patrick exclaimed, Oh, sweet Mother Mary of Jesus, why didn't you tell me your dog was a Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a reason today I started with uh, Father Patrick and Muldoon, which we'll tie into in a little bit later. But what I, for now, can I just see a show of hands? How many people have or have had their own business? Okay. Sort of, kind of. What sort of? What, what kind of? Well, business? family business. Family business. Okay. Joe, what did you? What kind of business do you have? Uh, it's export. Export business. Mm -hmm. And someone in the back who had their hand up. Just a business. Uh, lawyer. Lawyer. Okay. Um, how many people who uh, work for a company? Is there a show of hands? Everybody that works for a company. Okay. Randy, I remember your name. Good name. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Company. Uh, Baptist Health. Baptist Health. Okay. Anyone else? Another. Best company in the world, Publix Supermarket. I love Publix. <laughs> I, I love Publix. All right. And so, what's um, what I want to do now is just switch gears a little bit and ask if every one of us today we're going to open a hamburger stand. What's the one thing that we would need to be successful? Location, one location, 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 location. Okay, that's location. And anything else? Anyone else? Product. Product, okay. Product, yeah, you gotta have something to feed them. Marketing. 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 Well, you gotta have marketing, true, but what does what the marketing need to bring in? Customers. Customers. You need a starving crowd. You need a starving crowd, right? I mean, especially for hamburgers, especially with the competition with all the hamburgers. So, what do you need in your business to be successful, no matter what you do? Your own version of a starving crowd, right? Does that make sense? So, what business are you really in? This is where people unintentionally shoot themselves in the foot because they kind of uh, think of themselves as the doer of the thing they do. And it's natural, everybody does it. If you've studied law, well, I'm a lawyer. But if you don't have any clients, you can't practice law. Same thing if you're a dentist or if you work even in the corporate sector, if you uh, working for like a big part of the Publix, who are your clients? People. People, right. But usually, you're gonna find out who, who your other clients are. Without the people, you can't really do your job. If you have people that report to you or you report to, you can't really effectively do your job, as well as having your customers. Now, don't feel bad if you don't feel this way, or if you're not accustomed to thinking this way, because everyone's used to think, gee, I went to school to do this, or I've always done this since I you know, left home, this is my job, or they identify themselves with what they do. So it's kind of a, a switch to think of yourself as marketing yourself to get clients, rather than I'm the doer of the thing that I've always done. So learning how to attract, service, and retain your clients is a key skill that you need to think about aligning your purpose for. Now let's talk about the key reasons why most marketing fails. Now stop and think about it for a minute. 
who are the, or what kind of people are your favorite people to do business with? People that have money. People that have money, exactly. <laughs> well, that's one. They gotta be able to pay for your services. But I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts though, the people you like to inter interact with for business are people that you find either friendly, they take a personal interest in you, they're people that you enjoy doing business with. So is that right? Because if you uh, go someplace where you don't like someone or someone's rude to you, you're not gonna go back. That's funny. Uh, I live in Fort Lauderdale, and there's uh, anyone been to Lauderdale by the Sea, Commercial Boulevard, all the way to the beach? There's it's a cute little area, and it's kind of quaint. It's totally affected by the tourist season, and so now on one corner there's a restaurant, an outdoor restaurant that has all the business and it's all the local people, while all the other corners are dead. There's they have very little customers, and it's because of how they were treated, how they treated the local people out of season. Everyone flocks to the place where they were treated nicely, so. It's definitely how you treat people. Now, the three things we're gonna look at are your message, your market, and your media. Knowing these three key ideas is gonna set the foundation to allow you to elevate yourself above the clutter and really uh, put your head and shoulders above your competition so you can become the only obvious choice. And the reason I mention clutter too, the average person is exposed to over 5,000 marketing messages a day. So. You're not aware of it, driving to and from work, especially if you go online, you're hit with messages. That they, uh, Google has a service where you can see what you looked at. If you're looking at a news story, it pops up right next to you, the things that you checked out or looked at the past week. It's kind of freaky, I think, or kind of creepy. Like, oh yeah, I did look at that from outdoor world. Why is that showing up now? But uh, that's what they have. Now, the 5,000 marketing messages a day is up from 2,000 per day in 1972. So our marketing has definitely increased. So let's go to your message. The first thing I want to look at, the reason why most messages fail is most people don't have what's called a unique selling proposition or a USP. And all the USP is a way of explaining your position against your competition, against all other choices, actual or even imagined. Uh, a USP is also a way of summarizing or telegraphing your company's or your skills, unique benefits or the services of <coughs> marketing. Fresh hot pizza delivered in 30 minutes or less guaranteed. What company is that? Fresh hot pizza delivered at Domino's, exactly. That's an example of their unique selling proposition. Now, they don't say anything about good pizza, but they talk about pizza in general. You're gonna want a pizza, you know who to call, you'll get it in 30 minutes delivered. Uh, guaranteed. Well, it used to be. After all the traffic accidents and stuff, they had to change their unique selling proposition. Now, your unique selling proposition may also express the theme of your business or product. Uh, see if you can tell me which company this is. When it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight. Federal Express. Okay. Federal Express. Exactly. Federal Express. Now, your USP can be based on anything from your skill set individually to price to place to color to celebrity endorsement, or, as with the Federal Express example, extreme value of being reliable and consistent and uh, getting your package somewhere overnight. So how do you find that out as far as gearing your, uh, your message and your unique selling proposition? The number one question you can ask about your future clients is, what problem are they grappling with that you can solve, or what keeps them awake at night? You know, what problem are they grappling with that you can solve and it keeps them awake at night? So, moving onward, why do all this? Why put effort into creating a unique selling proposition? Why try to stand out or differentiate yourself or be seen as unique or compared to your competition or anybody else in your workplace? Like, what's the big deal? Because now more than ever, what's happening is because when our clients or prospective clients are not presented with any clear-cut differentiation by specialization, the only thing they really have to compare you with and they'll gravitate towards is price. You're gonna look at the cheapest option and uh, increasingly, customers price shop. In fact, how many people have the little scanner thing on their cell phones? Anybody have the little the barcode scanner on? Okay, there's one, two, three. Yeah, you can scan prices now. And it's happening because they're doing it online, usually in other places of business. It's the standing joke now that uh, Best Buy is Amazon's showroom. And so it's kind of like that chuckle chuckle, you know, go to, yes, you're right. But it's not funny to Best Buy, it's really affecting sales because people will go in, look, touch, feel, talk to the sales reps, and then they'll go home and they'll buy it online. So it's really great 
until something doesn't work and you have to send it back through Amazon. I don't know if anyone's had to deal with that. All right, so um, moving on to number two, who should you be marketing to? Who is your ideal client? It's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your revenue is generated by 20% of your clients. If you're in the corporate world, 80% of your results are 20, uh, generated by 20% of your contacts. So you could offer a product, a certain specialized procedure, uh, a certain group of people may buy your product. It's that 20% though that uh, will generate 80% of your results. It's funny, uh, the other day I used to sell dental supplies 25 years, in fact in this area, 25 years ago out of college. And uh, back then dental implants were a three week procedure. You know, they had to put the implant in and it was really new and novel and wow, titanium, you know, bone and skin graft to it, isn't that neat? And uh, what happened was the other day I heard on the radio, new dental implants in just one day. And that's their, this national dental chain in South, they're all over the country, it's a franchise. And that's their unique selling proposition now. No more weight, less pain. You can just go in, get your implant in the morning, and or get your implant done by the end of the day. So, when I was a teacher, my ideal clients really was administration. Uh, that was my 20% uh, that dealt with 80%. And the reason why is if anyone's familiar with the public education system, your lesson plans are a public document. And so if there's ever a problem, they could be called for in court. So they said, look, you could be the greatest, most dynamic teacher in the world. But if your plans aren't done on time in the way you ask you to do them, you're going to have to leave. So I didn't want to take that chance. Now, do you think Father Patrick knew who his ideal parishioners were? Or he would, if he knew who they were, that he would have suggested to Muldoon to go down the lane and talk to the Baptist church? Mm, I don't think he would have if he knew. So... What are you going to use to attract your clients? Media, number three. Now, this is interesting. Um, during the 2012 election, President Obama, he needed Colorado to win. I mean, to really seal the deal. It was kind of obvious after he won Florida and he saw the results moving westward. Uh, but he needed Colorado to win. And in particular, he needed Boulder County. Boulder County is 78% Democrat. He needed 72% of those 78% to win. So what did he do? He had a very um, good marketing team, and they were using something that's relatively new. It's called psychographics instead of demographics. Now, demographics is, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with it, just like your name, age, gender, race, annual income, number of kids, that kind of thing. Psychographics breaks that down into lifestyle clusters because we're more merging, where there's a lot less differentiation between, say, race and things like that. And so how people live together and share their lives together. And what they're finding is that People in certain lifestyle clusters that they're looking at also have a te uh, tendency to be heavy buyers of uh, or heavy, heavily transaction oriented towards using their discretionary income. So new homes, condominiums, loft apartments, um, things like that. And they're very big into technology. They're, they're technology adopters, and they tend to be urban and city dwellers. Now, what his campaign was able to do, and this is where it was really smart was he divided those, they divided the um, Boulder County Democrats into eight different sections. And they identified each section with a partic particular political issue that was important to each group. And they marketed to those groups within Boulder County. And they had a custom tailored message, so they marketed by phone. And if anyone's a registered voter, you know, you get marketed and pitched to everybody. You know, it doesn't matter what registered, what party you are, even if you're independent, you're gonna get hit. And they send the, the glossy cards, you know, you get the big postcards in the mail. Somebody knocks on the door, and then you get the phone calls. What his campaign did was they specifically targeted that message with, with the direct mail, with the phone calls. And then where they were really different was they would have somebody come out and speak to them specifically on that issue and how they thought the Obama campaign would help them. Um, and we know that, well, it's uh, history. The rest is history. They did very well, and they, he got reelected. And even his 2008 campaign, from a marketing standpoint, was brilliantly run. And uh, I think what you're going to see now is more groups and more businesses are going to start adopting psychographics. I just heard a thing, was it City? Not City. Well, one of the credit card companies is doing that now. And they have, they send up hundreds of messages, you know, trying to get people to take their credit cards. And they're constantly testing. And they have all kinds of things going on. And they're measuring and they're looking at what people like and what people don't like. Now. Knowing your message, your market, and your media, how can your club implement these, what you just heard, to attract more members? There's a couple things I found out. 
One is creating an emotional message that you get or an emotion that you uh, benefit, that you derive from volunteering and serving in Rotary and somehow projecting that to younger people or to other members. I'm assuming you want to try to get younger members. And there, there is an increase in younger members in the Rotary Club uh, across the United States. Now, as far as that emotional message, I, I can't help you with that. That's something you guys would have to talk amongst yourselves to see how can we present that to uh, get future members. What I found is there's a Walnut Creek, California Rotary Club. Uh, young woman started, I believe she's the youngest person to start a Rotary Club. And uh, her, her uh, members are in the 25 to 35 year old crowd. They meet after work at 5.30 and they uh, meet in a brewery. It's like a microbrewery in, in Walnut Creek, who knew? But uh, that's where they meet. And uh, what, so what she's found is that younger members usually have more time than money. So they're very involved in community projects. So that might be something you want to keep in the back of your mind. Las Vegas, Nevada has a club where they, uh, their younger members, they created like a sub club within the club. So they have people in the 25, 26, or you know, that age group, you know, mid 30s or mid 20s to mid 30s, and they'll be in that club for a year, kind of like to get them used to the rotary uh, way, and then they move and they transition into the, the larger club where the older members are. So those are some ideas uh, that you can think about. And you can find that online, or if you want to, when we're done, you can email me and say, hey, can you give me the list of that, those links, and I'd be happy to send them to you. All right, we have, uh, here's some bonus. We got some bonus time? How much time do we have? Uh, we got like eight, nine minutes. Eight, nine minutes, okay. Going a little fast today. Extra bonus section, is offline business dying? This brick because you hear a lot about uh, online, mobile apps, you can buy things from your cell phone. I don't know about you, but I, I'm very slow at texting. Um, my fingers are wider than I thought, and I always hit either more letters or numbers or less. Um, but some interesting statistics, e-commerce only accounts for 7.4% sales, of which the speed and pace of its growth is slow, very slow, at a snail's pace. It went from 6.8% in 2011 to 7.4% last year. It's projected to get to just 9.9% .9 by 2017. And then that 7.4% uh, from last year represents $317.9 billion. Mobile online purchases accounted for only 6.4% of online retail purchases in 2012, which squeaks out to me measly 0.47%. So it's only half a percent of all retail commerce came from mobile cellular phone purchases. So from 2008 to 2012, Online retail sales only increased 2.4%. It's projected to get to 80% of uh, all retail sales by 2039. So we still got a ways to go. We still got a long ways to go. Now, if any of you were thinking of uh, seeing if uh, Facebook would apply to your local business or your non-local business, national business, there's a website you can go to. It's www.isfbforme.com, and it's a, like a five-minute survey. You take that and it'll tell you if it's, yeah, it's worth having a Facebook page for your business or no, it's not. It really wouldn't be in your best interest. It's run by Perry Marshall. He's a stand-up guy. His information's good. Um, he's legit. So to wrap up, uh, focus on what keeps your client at night. What's your unique, uh, your unique selling proposition, your message, your market. Identify who are your ideal clients. And then lastly, your media, how are you going to reach them? How are you going to reach them? Any questions, comments? What was that uh, uh, address again? WWNFB? WWFB, like Facebook. Oh, just FB. FB. Yeah, just F is FBforme.com. Yeah. Is FBforme.com. Numeral four? Numeral four? Is FB for yes. Sir. Randy, every year at Christmas time, you know, like the big shopping, retail shopping time, we hear that the e uh, online products are just in, uh, purchases are increasing every year, mm -hmm. particularly at that time of the year. What is the, what is the percentage that you have? 
Yeah, I don't have that with me, but it makes sense that it would be very high because yeah. it's at that the time percentage of year. is higher than what you indicated. I know that. Yeah, and, but it, and in the whole course of the year, it all works out. So yeah. it's going to be a, a torrent, and I mean that's what I like to shop online too, yeah. you know, mostly because it, it's it's easier. So a lot of people are doing it during the holidays because it is a lot easier. Is Amazon going to affect all sales? Because they, are, they, they were denied entrance into the state of Florida to have their warehouse. Some states are waiting to object to them like Walmart. Right. You know, I think Amazon is going to, you know, remember a few years before Amazon, it was Walmart. You know, Walmart was the giant, the pariah that everyone hated. Now it's Amazon. In the 1880s, it was Macy's because Macy's had a four-story department store. Oh my gosh, and they're going to put everyone else out of business. So it always changes. I don't, I don't think it's going to affect. I think the problem with Amazon, I mean, one of the things uh, we talk about is the price. When you get the price, you can't be the second cheapest. So price is really a vulnerable place to, to use or a vulnerable thing to use as a marketing tool because someone's always going to undercut you. So Amazon is now, who knows who's going to evolve in the next you know, 10, 15 years. They're very powerful and dominant now. They're very, I mean, I enjoy shopping with them. But, but there's no after-sales service. Because right, you have exactly. company that shipped and it's very difficult. Oh yeah, and I had a problem. I mentioned that I, I alluded to that earlier. With um, you know, if you buy something that's like you would normally buy at Best Buy, you're not going to get. It. I bought a printer, and I'm stuck with it because I waited until after the time when it broke. So uh, I got a printer that doesn't work. Like in the back, should a small business person, sole proprietorship, use a marketing person such as yourself? And if so, how much does does it increase his business? Uh, that's a, that would be up to the small business person and the marketing consultant. It would really it goes on a need basis. I mean, um, they'd have to really sit down and see you know what your needs are and, and talk and see where you want to go. Uh, you can do it hire a consultant, sure, uh, but you could also there's things that if the consultant doesn't work out for you for whatever reason, there's also things you can do for yourself. There's a lot of resources that you can uh, learn how to market and, and do things. It, it's it's a it really you have to sit and talk to us is not a clear-cut answer but can it help absolutely absolutely just pointing it's really it's like a fresh set of eyes because a lot of people when they work in their business you've been doing it so long or you've been doing it a certain way that you don't know why a lot of times especially family businesses well this is what I learned from my dad he learned it from you know his mom and you know it's been passed down and they don't know why it's just always been that way so when a fresh set of fresh eyes comes in then you say oh well, why do you do it that way I don't know, we've always done it that way. And then it gets you to think and kind of stretch your, your boundaries, your self-imposed boundaries, and to look at things differently and then implement and see the results come in. But yeah, direct response marketing definitely would improve any business. So as you were talking, I was thinking about what my boss has said several times to me, which is the concept that not just companies have a brand, Mm -hmm. and the stock price that individuals do as well. So as an individual professional, we have a kind of you know, product price placement promotion. We have our own brand and a stock price that may vary over time, either trending upward or trending downward based upon past performance, both perceived and actual. Exactly. It's interesting. It's a, for me, it's been a very interesting concept to think about an individual having a brand of stock value that goes up or down based upon demand. And, 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 you're, and you're right, and that's a great way to look at it too. I heard that, I heard something similar that uh, sales trainer Brian Tracy says something very similar along those lines. He calls it, we all have our own personal services corporations.